Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Thank you so much for choosing to spend a little time with us viewing our Sunday morning worship experience. And I pray that you will receive something that will help you on your future journey. Let us start by praying. Our Heavenly Father, our prayer is that you will show us the importance of maintaining a conduct that is pleasing in your sight. Cause our conduct to line up with what we say as a sure way uh, to display holiness in our living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our text for today is found in Romans chapter 7, verse 9, 19. That's Romans chapter 7, verse 19, and I'm reading from the message version. It reads, I said, I decide to do good but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. And you remember the uh, King James version that basically says uh, uh, the good that I would do, I do not, but the evil that I decide not to do, that's what I do. Okay, that's where we are. Last week, our focus was on call to holiness. And this week, our focus is on conduct of holiness, a conduct of holiness. Now, the right focus for us to view this lesson is to ask the question, how does conduct of holiness look? What personality do we see when we observe someone with a holy conduct? One characteristic that I, that I offer was found in Jesus and its meekness. Jesus was not weak and never in the Bible is he presented as weak. Jesus never flaunted the power that was at his disposal, but he always taught his disciples to practice power under control. In uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 53 through 55, uh, a Samaritan village rejects Jesus. That's what this is about. And I'll read a few verses from that. Beginning with verse 53, it says, and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men, lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. And then also in the uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, deals with the ascension of Jesus Christ back to heaven. And this is the English Standard Version. It says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed in his own authority or power. Verse eight says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, the power mentioned is what we refer, what was referred to by our former pastor or late pastor, Reverend R. L. Leak Sr., as dynamo power or Holy Ghost power or power that is under control. Meekness is power under control, and Jesus demonstrating power under control uh, with us even today. Each of us, either by actions or thoughts, have done enough for him to just take us out. When Jesus went into the temple and turned over the table of money of the money changers, that was not a sign of weakness. The power of God's word used by Jesus and the Holy Spirit works to reveal to us our true self and, and in other words, to, to transform our mind from seeing us as being all good and, and better than somebody else to seeing the wretch that we are. And, 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 and our, 
our, sometimes our self-perceived notion that we are not prejudiced even. And I mentioned that because of the season that we are in. When in actuality, we are at least or almost as prejudiced as anybody else. You can tell by the way we choose specific people to sit beside, to hang out with. When everybody should be, according to holiness, if we're going to exhibit holiness, everybody should be good to hang out with or to sit with or to have conversation with. And that's not to say that you won't have some friends that you hold closer or dearer than others. But we ought to not have a respect of person. We ought to always want the same for others that we do ourselves. The only worthwhile comparison is comparing us to Jesus and not us to somebody else. We've sinned by omission or commission and come short of God's glory. All of us have. We've come up short at living in a way that is pleasing to God. And clearly the divine choice has in view an actual life change. When Paul talks about the good that I would do, I don't do it. And that that I would not do, that's what I end up doing. He has in mind a life change, the modeling uh, of character, or, or of, I'm sorry, the molding of character, a life change, a radical change of life. Style. We that are in Christ are new creatures. Behold, the old things are passed away. The old mindset, old way of thinking has passed away and all things have become brand new. We have a new way of thinking, even uh, as was mentioned in Thursday night's Bible study. Uh, now, this may be a, described as progressive sanctification. We are changing as we go. We are progressing, getting more holier than we were previously. So if it, it really behooves us to examine uh, the aspect of holiness, namely an actual improvement in our manner of life. That should be what we're looking for. When we look at ourselves in the mirror, do we see the Henry Jackson that I saw yesterday, or has there actually been an improvement in my manner of life? The person that I'm looking at, is it different from yesterday as it pertained to living in a way that is more pleasing in God's sight? And only, and, and, and I say this with all conviction, God's word is what we need to transform us from what we was to what we shall be. Though the believers must involve themselves in the process, we are in our involvement is not something that is praiseworthy. When we when we attend Bible study, when we uh, participate in the worship experience, that's not something that's praiseworthy. That's nothing for us to Put out, stick our checks out when somebody asks us, where we, where, you, where you been? I've been to church. Like if we, we've done something that's praiseworthy. The what's been praiseworthy is what God has done and is doing in and through us. So we should not act as though uh, what we are doing uh, could become a contributing factor to our acceptance by a holy God. Now, Ephesians chapter two, verse eight through nine says, for by grace you are saved or have been saved through faith. This is the message, this is the uh, English Standard Version. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no man can boast or no woman, no child, Nobody. Ephesians uh, chapter two, verse eight and nine in the message version puts it this way. Saving is all his idea, all God's idea and all his work. And all we do is trust him enough to let him do it. 
It's because it's God's gift from the start all the way to the finish. And we don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we've done the whole thing. We try to get credit for all of it. Salvation from the penalty of sin is already ours as a gift of God's grace. But by virtue of being born into the family of God, we should desire to reproduce the family likeness. This is the will of God for each of us. The starting point for the development of a holy character is the re realization that the mercies received from God call for an adequate, a sufficient, a correct response from us. And that is not a haughty, high-minded response. God gave us the example for any adequate response to him, which is found again in his son, Jesus Christ. Godly character is always an act of obedience. Jesus was obedient even unto the death on the cross. And Paul identifies this as the presentation of one's body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. That's Romans 12 and 1. When we observe what God has done for us, it's not too much for him to expect of us an adequate response of faith. This holy sacrifice takes place in our willingness to stop being conformed to this world and being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Paul's statement is not about the physical person, but the inner person, the spiritual body, the normal place within us, where the desire and purposes of the one who has become a new creation in Christ takes place. This dedication of the person will have to face the temptations to be conformed to this age, a temptation that can be met by the renewal of the mind. We will be tempted. But when we allow God through his word and the work of the Holy Spirit to transform our minds, then we can meet those temptations. The thoughtful recollection and appreciation of the divine mercies of God is what his word and his spirit will remind us of. That's our part. God has done the major part. So as to experience and ever-increasing transformation that is doubtless to be thought of as a growing conformity to the likeness of Christ. There's a song, Yield Not to Temptation, for Yielding is Sin. It says, each victory will help you or aid you, some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passion subdued. Look ever to Jesus and he will carry you through. Just as the Savior, just ask the Savior to help you, to comfort, strengthen, and keep you. And he is willing to aid you and he will carry you through. Through. Second Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 says, And we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord be are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. The more we see God, the more we are transformed because it's impossible to get a good view of God and not get a better view of yourself. And by the way, we are preaching a series uh, under uh, the umbrella of Woe is Me. Not war is, well, not war is me. That was the Old Testament part. But show me me. And in the Old Testament, we, Isaiah, the first six chapters was woe is me. And now we're uh, dealing with, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of sin? I thank God through Christ Jesus. In the previous verses, it's clear that the Holy Spirit is the agent 
of this transformation, but not the pattern. The pattern is Christ Jesus himself, the Holy Son of God. The apostles stress uh, this in writing to the Galatians who were struggling in their uh, misconception of the sufficiency of Jesus. Says my little children with whom I am again in travail until Christ be formed in you. The Holy Spirit is working to form Jesus in us so that it will become more than just words. Let me decrease so that you can increase. The Holy Spirit is working so that there will be less of us and more of Jesus Christ, and he's working constantly. <laughs> and, and, and in that aspect, we all grieve the Holy Spirit because a lot of times we don't want to be changed. Our confidence must be that even if the enemy... Uh, heats the furnace up seven times hotter than it normally is. We should be confident that he is able, that Jesus is able to, to finish what he started. So what was needed was their dependence on the Lord in all of the fullness of his power. The Greek were notorious for their laxity and sexual relaxation. In a lot of areas of our lives where conduct is important, we are lax. In other words, we don't, we don't put a lot of effort towards dealing with bad conduct. And, and too often, we give praises to bad conduct. A little bad butt child, and we talk about, oh, he's just so cute. Look at him. He need a belt on his behind. Uh, I digress. Please forgive me. So consequently, Paul had to cope with the issue, uh, especially among the Thessalonians and Corinthians. He makes several observations based upon the premise that uh, it is God's will that they be holy. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse three. And God, God's call had in view for them a holy life. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. Now, sexual ab abnormality is an insult to the Holy Spirit who has been given to them. Verse 8. And that's not to say that, that sex is not a good thing. But it's just like eating too much of something that causes us problems. You know, we, we moderation, and and the main thing is whatever we do, whatever we utilize that God has provided, we ought to do it on with God's instructions. Most of the time, we get a gift. We it's important that we look at the instructions so that we can learn how to put it together, how to operate it, or else we'll make a mess out of the whole thing. The body is not meant for immorality but for the Lord. The believer's body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And believers should not associate with a so-called brother who is guilty of immorality. Persistence is an ungodly course, uh, or, or rather persistence in any ungodly action or course or direction that you choose should bring expulsion from the church. And, and then we should not hang around. Because if you associate with somebody that's doing wrong, you can end up being guilty by association. The church must be protected, for it is holy and the temple of God, as is believer's body. Christians are continually reminded to greet one another with a holy kiss. And this is an example of what I've just said, as in Romans chapter 16, verse 16. Holy because we are free from any erotic associations in our mind. In other words, when we, guys, when we hold a, a hug a female, we all do it in a Christian way. 
And you got to have a great mind in order to do that. Ladies, if you're going to hug, hug a husband, be careful how you hug a husband. Not a husband. Uh, if you're going to hug a male, you ought to be careful. Be conscious of how you hug them, how you pull them. You get too close to them can affect them. And, and, and that's how we precipitate good, holy conduct and being conscious of what we do. In plain language, our sexual desire should be kept under control. It was a token of mutual love in the Lord to practice and to serve as a reminder of the fact that the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit daily. The Holy Spirit is, 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 is just moving and, and, and making sure throughout our day we are reminded of the love that God has for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 5 says, the hope and hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. Growth and holiness is not possible without the grace of God. Scripture is an inspired word or record of God and given by God for the purpose or to profit his people, a holy, powerful instrument intended to promote a life of godliness or holiness. Prayer should be linked with the word as it's naturally and expected uh, as an, a natural and expected response. For whereas the scripture is God speaking to us, in prayer, we respond to him. And that's why thankfulness ought to be dominant in our prayers instead of reading to God our wish list or our instructions to him. Thankfulness should be predominant. All of the stuff that we ask God for, he already knows we need it. And he desires to, to, to be good to us. But he needs to hear us say that we're thankful much more than, than he does. The Holy Spirit, who is very important for the interpretation of the word of God, as uh, stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of uh, who is from God that we might understand the things that God freely gives to us. The Holy Spirit is equally necessary for a sacri sac uh, satisfactory experience in prayer. We need to learn to pray in the spirit. Have a starting point. Use the, use the Lord's prayer as a, as a primer. But then allow the Holy Spirit to take over and, and, and the Holy Spirit will have you re repeating back to God his word. And if you can repeat God's word back to him. You know, you, 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 you're on your way to being holier than you are, not holier than thou, but holier than you are. And that's my experience. Romans 8 and 25 says, Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought to. But the spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. Just as Jesus is at the right hand of God, reminding him of the blood that he shed for us on Calvary. Likewise, the Holy Spirit is positioned between us and God, interceding by reminding God also of the blood that was shed and making sense out of our senseless prayers or words. These two factors, the word and prayer, both of them under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit and working together should produce the need uh, or the needed response of obedience to God that in turn results in holiness. 
Now, contrary to the widespread opinion, uh, extreme self-restraint does not promote holiness. What we don't do or how we work at not doing something does not promote holiness. For while it may move, uh, remove outward temptation, it does not deliver us from the inward desire. And God seeks to remove the inward desire. Let me close by reminding us that Jesus hung, bled, and he died on an old rugged cross. And they removed him from that cross and buried him in a borrowed tomb. But early the third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and in earth in his hand. And Jesus' obedience and meekness is our example of a holy conduct. It's also good to see other believers exhibiting this type of conduct. Holiness is, 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 is absolutely essential to the enjoyment of God here and in the hereafter. Some people make the mistake. They get so caught up in their mind that of their own holiness. Sometimes we get to thinking that we're so holy that we look at the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for a possible vacancy that we can feel. So be careful how you act holy and don't be holy. When you're being it, you don't have to act it. You don't have to uh, inform anybody of it. Whatever God is doing in your life, if he does it on the inside, it will show up on the outside without you having to blow a horn, toot your own horn. That's all I've got for this week. I pray that uh, something will bless you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, all our hope, trust, and reliance is on you to work in us and through us to reveal your power and to give us a transformed view of how to use your power in meekness and in obedience. And without you, we cannot do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't forget to wear your mask. Uh, practice social distancing, wash your hands often, and vote November 3rd or in in uh, early voting starts on the 14th or mail-in voting, vote. Vote. So long, and may God bless you real good.